I'm working under the assumption that uh, variability is akin to noise, and therefore neural variability is akin to neural noise. But that obviously is a position that's um, up for discussion. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to try and use the word variability, and you may or may not interpret that as noise. Okay, so there are obviously various ways of measuring variability, and I think this is very key. Um, and in terms of the type of data that I'm talking about, which is trial to trial variability, the standard measures are standard deviation, um, a robust or similar but more robust measure of that, the median absolute deviation, uh, and people generally in this field, because both of those scale with the mean, people generally come from what's called the coefficient of variation, which is where you take either standard deviation or the median mad and divide it by the mean or the median. So it just kind of scales that measure. Uh, and another variable which is uh, not applicable to reaction time data but is useful in the EEG data is something called interval <coughs> phase coherence. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what this is, uh, I'll try and briefly explain that here, it's actually quite complicated. Uh, where's the pointer? Q. Um, okay, so here, this is EEG data. And the x-axis shows time, uh, this is the onset of the stimulus, and on the y-axis we have trial amplitude, colour code, so increased amplitude is red, decreased amplitude is blue. And all I really want you to take from this slide is that here the, tra the trials are phase sorted, so they're sorted by 10 hertz phase. Uh, and you can see there's a kind of random phase here. Uh, <coughs> the company is really affected when the stimulus comes out at this point. But here, the trials look uh, different, I hope. You can see there's random phase here, uh, but when the stimulus comes on, there's a kind of reorganisation of the phase and phase across trials, because these are the trials here, starting from trial 1 to trial X. Um, the, phase, the trials become coherent uh, in phase. And that's the measure called inter-trial phase coherence. And you can plot it, this axis this here is a plot of that. So you can see here, when there isn't very much phase coherence, the value there is 0.4. If the values range from 0 to 1, so you can think of them in your mind as equivalent to, say, like a correlation coefficient. Uh, except there's no negative, it's 0 to 1. So here, the, there isn't very much phase coherence, so there's a low value here, although I know the plot looks the same at scale, that's 1, 0 to 1, there's quite a lot of phase coherence. And so <coughs> the more coherent the phase, the less variability. Uh, and that, therefore, is a useful measure for looking at variability in EEG. Now, the paradigm that I'm going to um, talk about, I won't really describe this in very much detail, but I became interested in looking at variability in EEG actually after a discussion with David in Glasgow. I think I visited for a talk, or there you are. Or, uh, I, think, I can't remember what the reason was. But anyway, we had a really interesting discussion about neural noise and David's ideas about this. And on the train on the way home, I thought, well, oh, I can look at that in my EEG data, which is where this idea came from. So I carried out a study where I was interested in the visual event potential in individuals with and without autism. Uh, and I'd already published these data. And in this task, people uh, looked at this, these images of Gabor patches, uh, and sporadically a picture of a zebra appeared, and the participant's task was to press a button when a zebra appeared. So I measured the visual event potential and various other things from that, um, which I, I won't obviously talk about now. But then I realised that this is a visual event potential, but with something like a visual remote potential, it's very robust and you can see activity on single trials. And this is an example of that. So with the ERP, this will be familiar, I imagine, to most of you, an ERP is created by averaging uh, a number of single trials. But um, you can see what people don't often look at is the underlying single trial activity that leads to the creation of that ERP. But you can plot it like I have here, and again from trial 0 to trial 65-ish, you can see there's actually quite, there's a degree of smoothing here, but nevertheless, there's actually a lot of uh, regular activity with a negative deflection followed by the positive deflection on every trial. So with that in mind, I actually, well, one extra step. Okay, so what's very important to mention at this stage is that I, there's a, a sense of, uh, I feel like there's, there's a need to convince people that there's something reliable here. Because of course, EEG data, anyone who records EEG data, is hard to collect uh, a decent clean signal. EEG is typically full of many artifacts, never the uh, mind from children or, or children with autism. So I um, took this very seriously and I carried out a very, very careful analysis on these data. And one of the steps, I don't have time unfortunately to really go into detail about it, but one of the important steps in that is to 
clean the data very thoroughly with a process called independent component analysis. Now, people may or may not know very much about this, and I don't really have time to go into it, but um, I'll leave this slide here so that if it arises in questions, we can talk about it. Um, but really, just briefly, ICA acts as a spatial filter, and then it's used appropriately. It helps to clean up the data in the sense because EEG is a linear summation of lots of different sources uh, in the brain, and ICA is a way of separating out those sources. So it allowed, allowed me to look at the visual potential independently or isolated from any of the uh, activity that's associated with blinking or heartbeat or even, say, alpha power uh, in the brain. So it gives a much clearer signal, which really um, is the key, I think, to uh, facilitating this type of analysis with single trial data. And therefore, while I think this, this technique is very valuable, if looking at single trial data, it shouldn't be taken lightly. I think you have to really pay a lot of attention to the analysis. So, with that being done, these are the measures that I looked at. Um, I was specifically there focused on the P1, the positive peak, for the simple reason that it was the most robust deflection in my data. All the participants generated a visual P1. Uh, so, I really just calculated these variables. So, the variability of the amplitude, and for that I defined a time window and looked for the maximum amplitude. Um, and obviously you can get that for every single trial and then I calculated the median absolute deviation. I scaled it so it's equivalent to a coefficient of variation. So I did that for amplitude and I did it for latency, so the time at which that peak occurs and I also calculated inter-trial phase coherence. So the participants, in the original study there were 20 children in each group. Um, but for this analysis I wanted to make sure that I it wasn't a problem, the data integrity wasn't a problem or wasn't going to confound my results. So I selected only the participants in each group who had a very clear visual vote potential in their data. And I matched, ensured that they were matched in terms of gender, age, and full scale IQ. So I wanted there to be no other differences between the two groups of participants. And here are the results. Uh, so David outlined some of the predictions that you might have based on increased neural noise, and this was borne out in the data. So here this is the amplitude variability, significantly greater in the participants with autism. Latency variability, also significantly greater in the participants with autism. Uh, and then this shows amplitude variability across the time course. So of course you can create, calculate median absolute deviation across X amount of trials at all these time points. And this is what's plotted here. So you can see at zero, this is where the target appears, and blue is the autistic uh, participants data. And there's a real increase, this is variability. I know it looks like a visual growth potential, but it's not. Its variability is increased here on the y-axis. So it seems specifically as though the variability is associated with some kind of a vote activity. So the recruitment of the neural networks that underpinning visual perception, that's where the, the variability seems to appear because if you look at the time course here, 100 or so milliseconds is about the time of the visual P1. And that's echoed in the next slide which shows you the time course of inter-trial phase coherence. So here again you can see the stimulus comes on and there's a big increase in phase coherence because like in the plot I showed you at the beginning, the oscillations are, are being perturbed and kind of regulating in response to that visual input. And Initially, there's no difference you can see between the participants with and without autism, but overall, the, uh, the participants with autism never quite seem to show uh, the same level of face coherence as the participants without autism, and also it seems to break down slightly earlier. So again, that kind of leads me to speculate that perhaps something underlying this is, is in the recruitment of neural networks associated with perception. So this is clearly a vote data, so I'm talking about variability in terms of a vote signal. So um, with all those three measures, amplitude variability, latency variability, and also this inter uh, phase coherence, uh, I take these data as, as reliable evidence for increased variability, let's say, whether you want to interpret that as neural noise, that again is, is the open question. So evidence for increased variability in participants with autism. And, of course, the question is, well, okay, with the clinical population, you may very well get these type of effects from artifacts. So, to try and account for that and satisfy myself that that wasn't the case, 
I looked at other possible differences between the EEG, and I'll just state now that there were no, in, in all these measures that I could think to look at, there were no other differences. So the only things in which the part of the ASD and the controls varied was in the variability. So the type of things that I looked at were just here, here are, these are the, the back projected scalp topographies of the independent components, and you can see that just eyeballing, there was no obvious difference between those from the participants with ASD and those without. Um, obviously, I matched the participants as closely as I could. Um, the number of epochs that were submitted to analysis was the same between the two groups. Some things, I think this is probably the most important, that you can fit dipole models to the independent components to try and get an estimate of source location. And when you fit that model, you get a residual variance. And obviously, the lower the residual variance, the more accurate the model fit. So comparing residual variance of the dipole fit for the component between the two groups yielded no difference. And that's a real key indicator of data integrity or the, the quality really of your ICA decomposition. So they were the same the two groups. If anything, was slightly lower, i.e. better dipole fitting in the autistic group. Uh, and other things like the number of data points submitted to ICA. So on no other measure, even in terms of amplitude, say peak amplitude, on no other measure could I find differences between the participants with and without autism, except these variability measures. So, um, personally, I find that compelling uh, because I can't think of any other explanation as to, to why you see that difference other than there is increased variability in the participants with autism. So, again, to, um, well, to put that in the context of further work, so obviously there's converging evidence. Uh, an MRI paper subsequently came out that showed similar in terms of the vote activity. They extended my findings because they presented stimulated auditory and I use visual, so they used auditory visual and somatosensory domains. They also found variability. Um, I have some new data which I can very briefly talk about. I can't believe it's a million left. That's so this IPM came from uh, Daniel Baker, who organised the Great Symposium on Lawrence at the recent ECPP meeting, who talked about variability in the steady state vision of both potential. So again, I have to acknowledge Louisa Rosas is here, because this is her PhD data. I won't go into it really, just to say that I did the net, as Dr. Louisa did, an analysis to look at variability in the steady state vision of potential, which really replicated what I found. So that's a, a separate data set with a separate paradigm. Um, here we are. This, instead of being a vote, um, like a transient visual vote potential, this is actually power. So variability in power. So here's the power spectrum. Um, and this is the difference in variability between the typically developing children and the controls. Interestingly, this was, the variability difference was only seen with luminance stimuli rather than chromatic stimuli. This is quite a new analysis, and there isn't time to go into that. But just now, in the interest of uh, balance, uh, there is one study that has failed to find any difference in variability between individuals with and without autism. And this paper, unfortunately, is really hard to find. I only knew about it because after I published my paper, the author sent it to me. Um, it doesn't, doesn't crop up in terms of my literature search, and maybe I didn't use the right key terms. But um, this is a study using MEG to um, measure brain activity with sensory stimulation in participants with and without autism, and basically they didn't find any evidence for increased variability. They coefficient of variation, of the standard deviation, they found no difference. So on balance, um, I'm presenting to you, there are of course numerous examples of increased behavioural variability, and I'm telling you about three, two of which are currently published, my Frontiers paper and the Dinstein work, examples of increased variability of evoked neural response and one published study showing no difference. Of course, we don't know how many people have looked at this and haven't published it. Okay. That's the problem with the results, but there you go. So, outstanding questions. Um, what is the relationship between neural variability and behavioural variability? I hope you will allow me just a minute to, think, to talk about that, because it was so relevant to what Cathy was saying, so I'll talk about that very quickly. What is the relationship between neural variability and task performance? Now, I think this is really crucial, and there hasn't really been very much discussion on it this morning, really, I think. Maybe it's been more theoretical. It's something I've tried to look at with my own data, because with these types of tasks, uh, and again, in a minute, I'm going to mention Abby Dickinson, who's another of my fantastic PhD students, who looked at this in some of her data. When we have an EEG task and a separate orientation discrimination task, and we've actually found no relationship between variability in the EEG signal and performance on that task. But um, 
again, this was quite a quick analysis that I asked her to do because I knew it was doing the talk. So that's just, it's not public, it's just my, my sense from the data. Another question is, in the increased neurovirus specific to ASD, that question is very easy to answer because I'm sure the answer is no. Um, I think we're going to hear about something in the next session, but also I want to draw your attention to a very recent paper which has talked about increased variability of theta power in individuals with ADHD. Um, okay, so in terms of this question, I will just focus on quickly question one, the relationship between neural variability and behavioural variability. So the Macintosh work, which Cathy mentioned earlier, has a kind of counterintuitive uh, explanation or demonstration that increased behavioural variability is associated with decreased neural variability. But my experience in my own data is that that's not the case. So in this zebra task, when participants are pressed on this or a zebra, the variability in terms of their reaction time variability correlated positively with their EEG variability, despite the fact that the EEG data were recorded from trials where people weren't making a response. So it's a separate trial set. So that correlated. And then again, in Abby's uh, work, Abby's doing this looking at orientation discrimination. So we measured uh, variability in that, and also in the in, in EEG task. We found, again, positive correlation. And this is interesting. So this is an orientation threshold discrimination task measured with a staircase. So there are eight reversals for that staircase. The variability around those reversals, which is what's on the y-axis, is positively correlated with amplitude variability of the P1. So it seems as though if you have neural variability, you also like to have behavioural variability, which is in contrast to this whole Macintosh idea, which Cathy outlined and I very briefly schematised there. And I'd like to suggest the explanation for that, um, which is that if you read the Macintosh paper very carefully, their index of neural variability isn't trial-to-trial -trial variability in the way I've described it here, it's multiscale entropy. And people who know about this will know that that's a measure of complexity. And the term complexity and variability in the literature seems to have been used interchangeably, in my opinion. But um, I would put forward that you have to think about complexity and variability in the sense that I've measured it as two different things. And if you do that, um, so yes, yeah, sorry, if you do that, I'll come back to that side in a minute, you basically get a table that looks like this. So here's complexity, indexed by water scale entropy, here's variability, as in trial to trial variability as I've done. Increase in childhood, um, variability, that seems to be yes. And the data that that's based on is in this previous slide, oops, um, which again is work from Louisa. We looked at variability in the steady state of work potential between children and adults. We found no evidence that it decreased which is contrary to what Macintosh is saying. If anything, we found that it increased a little bit. It was increasing the children. So taking us to that table, complexity according to Macintosh is increased in adults, but actually variability is, if you look at it, possibly deep, uh, decreased in adults. Complexity um, is negatively correlated with behavioural variability, but variability actually seems to be positively correlated. So you can make opposite predictions, the point I'm trying to make with this table, is your complexity and variability can make opposite predictions. And when it comes to autism, I've demonstrated, and others, Finstein, etc., that variability is increased in autism, but complexity is actually decreased. When you look at more scale entropy of EEG signals, <coughs> some people may call variability, but it's actually complexity, it's decreased. So I know I've gone away from my time and I apologise for that, but um, these are my conclusions. Neural variability is increased in ASD. Neural complexity is decreased in ASD, that's based on someone else's work. Behavioural variability is increased in ASD, and that's exactly what would be predicted by both of those two statements. So actually, although it looks inconsistent, the work from Macintosh and other people's, it's actually highly consistent. So I haven't really discussed the implications, but I hope I have convinced you that there is a real effect in terms of variability.